Hi hey, everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Justin Goodman. I'm a research associate supervisor at PETA in the laboratory investigations department. And I work almost exclusively these days on animals and education issues. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about today uh, about the problem of the use of animals in education from a variety of different standpoints, why it's an important issue to address, and how you can effectively address it. And, uh, my first slide, the animation is being a little wacky, so it's just going to come up all at once. I'll talk you through it. Um, the estimate, the most recent estimate, is that there's more than 20 million animals used in the United States each year for educational purposes. 12 million, 12 million of these animals are used for dissection alone, and the most common ones, frogs, fetal pigs, cats, fish, um, perch is a common fish that's used in classroom dissection, and earthworms. I'm sure some or all of you have been encountered with this with the dissection issue at least at some point and probably partook in it. I know when I was a kid, I think we dissected a worm uh, and that was it. Most of these animals, well, most of the frogs that are used in classroom exercises are captured in the wild. Uh, approximately three million of them uh, come from the wild. And the rest are purpose bred in laboratories or obtained from pounds. In the case of cats, uh, they're cats who've been euthanized for a variety of different reasons, and schools purchase them from the pounds. And then farms, uh, fetal pigs, for example, they're cut from the stomachs of their mothers who are, who are killed for food, and then they sell them to biological supply companies who fix them in formalin and then sell them to schools. Uh, and there's a variety of different uses for animals in education. Uh, dissection, as I mentioned, classroom experiments on live animals. These are more common on the university level. Uh, in physiology courses or neurobiology courses, uh, some A and P courses, at anatomy and physiology, uh, animal science, for example. There's animals used in science fairs. The largest science fair, for example, in the United States, uh, uses and this is people who are you know K to 12 kids. Uh, 30,000 animals are used each year for the science fair. Uh, medical training, uh, pigs are used for surgical training courses and veterinary training. And the veterinary training issue is a little different. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but it's a little different than the rest because in most of these cases, they're just teaching you general information about anatomy that could be that, in some cases, they expect you to be able to extrapolate to, the, to humans. So the cats are most commonly dissected in a human anatomy course, and they expect you to be able to then take that and learn about human anatomy, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But in veterinary training, if you're dissecting a cat and you're going to go you're going to plan on going and treating cats and understanding cat anatomy and physiology, it makes a little more sense. And in the veterinary field, there are ethically sourced cadaver programs where people whose pets are going to pass away, are uh, these people sign an agreement and donate them. Tufts has a very progressive program where they source all their animals from people who donate their bodies to science. There we go. So why does this issue matter? Uh, well, obviously, it matters from an ethical perspective because we're talking about 20 million animals who are dying each year for animal experimentation. Uh, but beyond the animal issue, there's also an issue with how this affects students, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. But there's long-term psychological impacts that this has on students and also the trajectory of how these people's careers progress and how science progresses, uh, and I'll address that. Uh, as an educational issue, all the research that's available shows that the use of non-animal methods for things like dissection and even live animal use, um, the use of non-animal methods is equivalent or superior in its ability to uh, impart the same knowledge on students. Um, a common defense you'll hear from, it, from it, uh, experimenters or teachers is that, well, you have to dissect an animal to understand the, part, the different parts of the animal. Or how are you going to become a doctor uh, if you've never felt uh, living tissue before or dealt with tissue and organs before. Uh, in 2002, Mark Beckoff, who's an ethologist, wrote a paper and he said, well, if dissection was so, if dissection was so, um, I forget what the quote is. He says, basically, if dissection was so important, then it would be mandatory on all levels of education, and it's not. And I'll talk about why it's not and how it's not in a little bit. Uh, from an ecological perspective, as I mentioned, three million frogs are coming out of the wild each year. And from an economical perspective, uh, 
Um, it's much cheaper to use non-animal methods. In the case of live animals, you're not purchasing, the school isn't purchasing them, they're not having to house them, provide veterinary care for them, dispose of them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I won't talk about that too much because that's not really what I'm interested in. But it is compelling when you're dealing with a uh, with university or a college or a high school about the issue. So back to animal use and education. Oh, by the way, you could stop me at any point to ask questions. We have enough time and there's few enough, few of us here. So. Uh, again, dissection, classroom experiments on live animals, medical training and veterinary training are the main uses of animals in classrooms. There's also, if you want to think about middle schools and high schools that have like a, a classroom pet, for example, that would fall under uh, animals in education. A lot of those classroom pets end up either being taken home by children or then given, I know a lot of the baby chicks end up going to chicken farms where obviously they'll be killed for food. Uh, there's little to no oversight of the use of animals in education. Um, the oversight issue is a problem in vivisection in general, but if you look at the animal ed in education issue, when most of the animals are being used on the high school level and below, there's actually no regulation at all that applies to high schools um, and middle schools. And dissection, the use of dead animals who are already dead in the classroom, is completely unregulated. Um, and most classroom experiments with live animals are not governed by federal laws and guidelines. This is because they're dealing with animals who aren't regulated by the Animal Welfare Act. So uh, birds, uh, cold-blooded animals, and mice and rats, who are the most common animals being used in the classroom, are not covered by any of the federal laws that govern animal experimentation. Uh, and there is, in some cases, uh, some physiology classes will use live rabbits. And the Institutional Oversight Committee at a university, for example, would have oversight of that because that animal is regulated by the federal laws. Um, but this is a very small number of cases. Again, we're talking about frogs in most cases, mice, and rats, fish, and those types of animals. Uh, it seems to be the, 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 the most common defense of animal use in education is that, again, I mentioned this earlier, it's self-evident. If you want to understand animals, you have to get in there, you have to get dirty, you have to have this visceral experience cutting up animals and feeling what it's like to be inside of an animal. Uh, and that's simply not the case, and there's absolutely no evidence to support that you need, to do, you need to harm animals in order to understand them or in order to understand any type of biological process, whether it's simple or complex. There's a variety of different ways to do that that don't involve harming animals. Uh, we all took sex ed classes in high school. I think most of us probably had a pretty good understanding of how the human reproductive system worked. Uh, there was no assignment that involved us going home and having sex with each other. Uh, so I, you know, I think that's a good example of how silly it is. That the only way to understand this process is to get in there and get dirty and participate in it. Um, and there's, again, there's questionable educational and scientific value. These are just some citations of papers that have shown this. Some of these are systematic reviews, uh, the Knight 2000 paper and the Petronic Rausch 2007 paper were systematic reviews of papers that were comparative studies of animal use versus uh, non-animal use for obtaining the same educational goals. And in all of these cases, uh, the animal use was, the non-animal use was equivalent or superior in terms of the learning outcomes of students. Uh, so I said there's psychological impacts for students, and this is an ethical concern when we're talking about the use of animals in education. Uh, and if we look at the research, there's students at all educational levels who are uncomfortable with animal use, who oppose animal use, who opt out of animal use. Uh, middle school students, high school students, undergraduate students, and medical school students. And actually, it's interesting, in the, in the Arluk study in 1996, this involved a physiology course that used live dogs. There was a live dog lab. And many of the students, when they went into the lab, were uncomfortable. Actually, the title of the paper is From App Apprehension to Fascination. Um, the students were very uncomfortable with having to kill a dog for this, you know, this learning exercise. And the way they coped with it and came to terms with having to do it, because it is required, was they said, well, the TA in the course is the one killing the dog. Or this dog was purpose bred for this. It's not really like killing my pet dog. Uh, so they use all these different um, justifications to make themselves feel comfortable with actually par participating in killing an animal in the class. But when, but when they were first introduced to it, and before the teachers got in their ear and explained, well, you have to do this. You're not. It's not a bad thing. You ha you have to do this for your career. Uh, the animal isn't suffering. People are uncomfortable with it. Um, and harming animals can lead to psychological trauma. Uh, Theo Capaldo, who's the president of the New England Anti-Vivisection Society, published a paper in 2004. Uh, and, she looked, and she looked at how the DSM-IV uh, defines what trauma is. 
And trauma is witnessing an event, this is one of the, part of the definition of trauma, witnessing an event that causes death, injury, or a threat to the physical integrity of another person. And of course we can apply this to a person, a non-human person, uh, any type of animal. Uh, and when people experience this type of psychological trauma, they experience withdrawal and avoidance, or how they cope with this. So in the case of withdrawal, if we look at these classroom exercises, we see that students will opt out of having to have anything to do with something like this. Uh, they'll drop a course, for example. Uh, or avoidance, they won't ever take a course again that involves that type of animal use. And in a lot of cases, okay, and this falls into my next point here, in a lot of cases, it will completely change the trajectory of someone's educational career, having to do something like this. And if you look at the literature, the Arluk study, the Solid and Arluk study talks about this a little bit. Um, there were students, these were seventh grade students in the, in the middle school study. Uh, and there were students in the class, especially females, who said that they wouldn't pursue careers in science because they were exposed to science as something that involves harming animals. Uh, and they were uncomfortable with that. Uh, so this problem, you know, obviously contributes to the gender gap, for example, in the hard sciences and the life sciences where people are being exposed to science as something that's violent when they're kids and they don't want to have anything to do with it when they grow up. Um, so you get people who are going into science, in the hard sciences and the life sciences again, who have been socialized to be comfortable with harming animals. Um, and these are the type of people who go on to be vivisectors when they grow up. People who have been brought up to say, this is what science is, this is how you do it, this is an acceptable way to do science. Um, and this is why it's such an important issue. Because if kids weren't in, in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, uh, being forced to harm animals, then when they got to college and they were given an la uh, animal laboratory, for example, or when they got to grad school and they were assigned to partic participate in some animal lab as their TA assignment, uh, they wouldn't just accept it as part of what you have to do to be a scientist. Um, and this perpetuates the problem of vivisection. People aren't born vivisectors, right? Just like we're not born meat eaters. Uh, we go through a socialization process that makes us feel comfortable with these things. Uh, and the same goes for vivisection. So getting at the root of the problem is attacking these issues when people are still young, uh, before they've been brainwashed into thinking these things are acceptable. Um, yeah, I, I think I talked about this again, this again so, well, that's, see, it's important. <laughs> yes. Non-animal learning methods. So what are we talking about when we talk about non-animal learning methods? People always say, you can't do everything on a computer. Well, you can do a lot on a computer, but there's a variety of different ways we can do these things. We can use computer software. Uh, we can use DVDs, we can use plastic models, uh, self-experimentation, human experimentation. Uh, that was, well, this is virtual reality. We can use virtual reality, lifelike mannequins. mannequins. This is actually uh, just to show how esoteric some of these things are and how they're designed for everything. That's an alpaca venipuncture model. So if you're going to be studying some kind of farmed animals, uh, instead of harming animals, by in order to learn how to draw blood, they have these models uh, for something as obscure as an alpaca to learn how to do that. Uh, naturalistic ob observation, which isn't really non-animal, but it's not harmful. Uh, so are these things effective? One of the biggest arguments against this is that these things couldn't possibly give you the same knowledge as dealing with animals in a harmful way in a classroom. And I said, across the board, these non-animal learning methods have been shown to be educationally equivalent or superior to traditional animal labs. And this is uh, traditional animal labs, whether it's dissection or some kind of live animal use. Um, and the research shows that these methods show, these methods provide students with a superior understanding of complex biological processes, increased learning efficiency, and increased examination results. They also increase student confidence and satisfaction and they increase, increase preparedness for labs and information retrieval and communication abilities. And they also save time, staff time and are more economical than animal-based methods. So it seems that here, I mean, in every way that you would want some kind of learning tool to benefit your students and you as an educator, these things can do the job. And I'm just going to give you some examples. I try to set it up so each one of the methods I mentioned earlier, I address them at least once. Um, and I'll go through them as quickly as I can. Videos. As far back as 1968, high school students who watch videos of animal dissections performed better on tests than students who actually dissected the animals. This is merely by just watching a video of, of animal anatomy. Computer simulations for anatomy. 
Undergrads using computer simulation of a rat dissection scored higher on a test than people who dissected rats. Physiology. Undergrads studying intestinal absorption using a computer program scored equally well on a test as students who dissected rats, and the non-animal method was much cheaper. Uh, at a medical school level, med students who, oh, and actually there's a reason I bring this one up. Medical students who use both computer demonstrations and animal demonstrations to study cardio cardiovascular physiology rated the computer model as a superior learning tool. At OHSU, um, in the first year physiology course, they are one of the, I think it's about half a dozen schools right now, they're one of half a dozen schools in the United States that still uses animals in its medical school curriculum. And what they use, are, they use pigs for a physiology course. Every other school is replaced with either computer simulation, human patient simulators, or um, self-experimentation where they'll, they'll use imaging technology to experiment on each other to see how the heart works. Uh, clay modeling. This one's especially interesting. A new paper just came out about this, that people who use clay models, so actually going in and you have a skeleton, and you have, you're given clay and you're supposed to mold the different parts of the human anatomy. Uh, people who do that, students who do that, score better consistently, and this was stated in two different papers that came out by two different groups of researchers, score better than people who dissect cats. More examples. Plastic models, better. Self-experimentation, better. Naturalistic observation. I mean, something as simple as going into the park and studying feral pigs, students have scored better than students who use rats and conditioning in laboratories. So keeping rats in a cage in the classroom, uh, either you know you could shock them, you could uh, deprive them of food to get them to press a lever, things like that. Um, and human patient simulators. So across the board, these things uh, have proven to, be, proven to be educationally equivalent or superior. In 2008, the National Science Teachers Association and the National Association of Biology Teachers, which are the foremost professional organizations covering teachers who are teaching life sciences, that uh, this would cover the K to 12 and college level, both amended their position statements to acknowledge the educational efficiency, efficacy of non-animal learning methods. Now, they don't completely endorse them as replacements. So, again, we have this cultural problem where we're dealing with millions of teachers across the country who have been trained to do animal dissection as a part of their curriculum. Uh, as an acceptable way to do science. So the NSTA and the NABT still endorse the use of animals, but they have now changed their position statements to acknowledge that the non-animal learning methods are uh, effective and you can replace them in cases where students have requested them or you feel they're appropriate. Now, if these w methods were as deficient as most people will make them out to be, as most science teachers would make them out to be, the, the professional organizations would not be endorsing them in any way whatsoever. And on the, college, on the medical school level, in 2007, the American Medical Student Association, which is the country's oldest and largest professional organization representing medical students, amended its position statement and now strongly encourages the replacement of animal laboratories with non-animal alternatives in under, undergraduate med medical education, which is medical school. So why does this problem persist? In every way whatsoever, the non-animal methods are better. Uh, from an ethical sp standpoint, from an economical standpoint, from an ecological standpoint, and from an educational standpoint. Uh, I think that's probably shown. Uh, there's no sci sound scientific or educational or moral justification for the use of animals. So that's on our side, right? What are the obstacles? So why does this persist if all the research shows that we can do it better and do it in a more humane way? Why does it persist? Teachers aren't encouraged to explore the issue. Most dissection happens on the K-12 to level uh, with high school students, for example. Uh, and if you ever have looked at, most of you probably haven't, but if you looked at a curriculum or the guidelines for high school education, there's never any mention of dissection. This isn't something that's required by a school board. It's not required by any national education standards. Um, it's just something that's kind of reflexive for people. Oh, we have to teach biology. We have to teach the life sciences. Well, when I was a student 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we did dissection. I've been to doing dissection for the last 30 years of my class, and I'm just going to continue to do that. Uh, and there's been no discussion in the literature uh, aimed at these people about changing a paradigm shift, about uh, thinking about replacing dissection for all the reasons I've mentioned. Uh, teachers are resistant to change. Again, if you've been doing something for decades, if you've been trained that this is the way to do something, it's going to be difficult to convince someone otherwise, especially if 
you're an outsider. If you're not a teacher, um, if you're not a colleague, you're not a peer of these people, uh, they're going to be especially resistant to your message. And especially if you're coming from the animal advocacy community, uh, people don't want you telling them what to do. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how you can do this and uh, how you can attempt to do this and open up this dialogue. Uh, a concern of teachers, and this is a valid one in some cases, are the potential costs and other resources involved. If you're comfortable with something, if you've been doing it for a long time, there's no effort in introducing it the next year and the next year and the next semester and the next class. It's just something you're comfortable with, something that takes very little effort. Um, you don't have to, and you don't have to learn to, you don't have to relearn your educational um, approach. But when you're talking about introducing something new, whether it's a new software program or any of these learning methods I've mentioned, uh, you have to relearn things. You have to relearn, uh, you have to learn what's available. Let me just skip for a second. Um, unfamiliarity with information about alternatives. So these are our two biggest concerns here, is that people don't know what's out there. Uh, they don't know how much it's going to cost. They don't know how they're going to go about integrating it, so it's much easier to continue what they've just been doing. Um, so you have to find a way to open up this dialogue with people. Um, and you want to be able to open it up a dialogue with teachers. You don't want to have some kind of adversarial relationship where you're forcing them, or they feel like you're forcing them to do something they don't want to do. Um, and that's important when you're approaching this. So what can you do about all this? Do your homework. You have to gather information about classroom animal use. Uh, you may know about some kind of classroom animal use from personal experience. You may be in a class where they're about to dissect animals or they have dissected animals. You can use the internet to go on a school's website. Uh, I know a lot of the K-12 schools now have blogs or some kind of website where you can read about upcoming courses or the, the teachers will be reminding students, oh, next week is the rat dissection we're doing. That's how we learn about, um, not a lot, but a good portion of the issues that we address and the cases we take on are things we learn about through the internet. You could set up something as simple as a Google alert for the word dissection, and you're going to get all these hits every day for people who are dissecting animals or planning on dissecting animals. A lot of students will take pictures with their camera phones, put it on their blogs, and post it on the internet. Actually, a couple of the pictures I showed earlier, the two gruesome ones, were from a, uh, I think it was a high school student who posted these on her web page. And those animals, they, the students actually killed them in the classroom and then dissected them, and they had pictures of all of this. Um, public records request on the college level, uh, whether it's for live animal use or dissection, you could submit a public records request. Uh, here in Oregon, you can do that. Uh, for protocols, in the case of live animal use, uh, classroom worksheets, syllabi, invoices for animal purchases or acquisitions, so you could, you'd know if your school got its animals from the Humane Society or if they were purchased from a biological supply company. And in the case of live animals, again, you can get animal care records and things like that. So these are just a, a few of the different ways you can find out about what's happening in your community. Uh, and you'll want to research the non-animal learning methods that are available. I was just talking earlier with someone that there's a lot of websites out there. This is a few, these uh, International Animal Learn. These are a few of the databases that are available. PETA doesn't have a website uh, that goes through these learning methods, but we have some materials we've prepared that we use in our campaigns and cases uh, that break down all the different animal uses that are common and the different non-animal learning methods that are available. Um, and there's these loan programs. Uh, AAVS is Animal Learn Program, NAVS, uh, New England Anti-Vivisection Society, and HSUS all have loan programs. And when you're encountering, when you're confronting teachers and the issue of economics comes up, um, it's kind of a moot point because you can get any of these learning methods for free. They can loan them for a semester, they can loan them for, for a year. And as long as they return them, there's no cost involved. Um, even if you do need to purchase these programs, uh, for example, Digital Frog, which is one of the most popular frog dissection programs, you could buy a license for your entire school for $700. You could install the program on every single computer in your school, burn 20, well, you mean you could realistically burn as many as you want, but the license allows you to burn 20 copies for kids to take home or for teachers to take home to get familiar with them. Um, so that's a one-time $700 purchase. You never need to purchase any supplies <coughs> again. Uh, whereas with animal dissection, you're buying animal specimens, you're buying supplies, you know, there's all these uh, incidentals. So there's possible objectives for these campaigns. The, yeah, my funny graphic. Um, complete replacement of certain animal uses. Most of the things I work on at PETA uh, are 
related to replacing certain animal uses. P2 works more on the choice issue. Uh, and we work on a few of these choice campaigns, but mostly we're working to replace certain animal uses. Uh, we have campaigns going at Marquette University, University of California, Irvine, uh, Saginaw Valley State, which is a small school in Michigan. Uh, and these are schools where students have come forward and said, uh, I'm enrolled in this class, or a friend of mine is enrolled in, enrolled in this class, and this is what they're doing to animals. And we'll approach the school and say, we've learned you're doing this. Uh, here's a variety of different other ways you can be doing the same thing that are just as effective and much cheaper and much more humane. Uh, in the cases I mentioned, they've ignored us, so we've escalated things a bit, and we have campaigns where there's action alerts, and we've done protests and petitions and things like that. Um, so that's if you're going for a complete replacement of certain animal uses. And I want to stop here, actually, for a second and say that most vivisection campaigns, and I, you know, I come from a background working on traditional basic research laboratory OMPRC type vivisection campaigns, where it's very hard to not only think of some kind of object objective short of shutting down the whole operation um, that's practical uh, and that's going to be a good use of your time and resources and that's actually going to help animals. Uh, in the case of classroom animal use, whether it's dissection or live animal use, this is a very attainable goal that's going to help a lot of animals. Uh, whether it's getting a choice policy implemented or whether it's getting one laboratory in one class at one university stopped for good, getting a, one teacher to replace one animal laboratory, you're going to save dozens of animals. And if we take animal interest seriously and we care about one animal as much as we care about 100 animals, then that's important. Um, and you can do this on the classroom level and on the school level much more so than you can do on the university level when you're trying, you're dealing with NIH grants, people who are entrenched in, entrenched in animal experimentation for a variety of social and economic reasons. Um, so replacement's important. And choice, the student choice policies, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, can lead to that. So there's state level choice policies. Oregon has one for K-12, and there, these exist in 15 states. There's a school-level policy. Uh, PCC and OSU both have school-level policies, and I know people are working on that here as well. There's classroom level. Some teachers will give students choice, even if it's not an official policy in their state or in their school. Um, and these are useful for individual students uh, and for opening up the discussion with your teachers. The, state, the best state-level choice policies, and Oregon's is a few years old before they started using this language, uh, they address dissection, they address uh, any kind of observation or manipulation of animals, and they address vivisection. And again, this is the K-12 to level. None of the choice policies address college, the state-level ones. Um, and the best policies also require that the, the, the teachers and the educators and the administrators are the ones who go out and have to seek out these alternatives for students. So it forces them, even though they've been resistant for a long time, it forces them to go out, familiarize themselves with what's, with what's available. And that's a good thing because it's often very difficult to open up this dialogue. So if this legislation is going to force them to do that, that's a good thing. But they're not ends in themselves. So if you can, you, there's 15 states that have choice policies. And a choice policy is only as strong as the number of students who are going to request the alternative, right? So if only, you know, if no students ever request the, the alternative, then the animals are going to continue to be used. So, you know, states get choice policies put in place, and that's a great thing, and we celebrate that. That's very nice. Uh, a school may get a choice policy, a classroom may get a choice policy. But we, we have to be much better about following up on this and encouraging people to use that choice policy because you're going to reach a tipping point eventually, and this would be the goal of any choice policy or anyone who takes uh, animal rights seriously. The goal of a choice policy is going to be able to reach, when you're going to be able to reach a tipping point when more students are requesting the alternative than the animal-based method and the schools will just switch over because it's not going to become economical anymore. And that's, you know, that's great for animals and it's great for students. Uh, there are some school-level alternatives policies. Um, for example, Indiana University, and this applies to live animals, uh, Indiana University has its own policy that says living animals are only used when there are no valid alternative to their use. Um, as I said, the federal laws don't address most animal uses in the classroom because of the species who are involved most frequently. And even when the federal laws cover animals, federal legislation doesn't require that alternatives are used. So some schools have taken this extra step, whether or not it's implemented is a different story, or whether or not it's taken seriously is a different story. Um, but they do have school-level alternatives policies that encourage teachers, I know Stanford has something similar, and encourage teachers to use alternatives. 
Um, city level legislation, there are certain cities that have, for example, bans of use on live animals and science projects. And there's state legislation. We have two bills in Connecticut right now where I live. Uh, HB 57, House Bill 5708 is a complete ban on dog section in the state. Uh, most likely, this bill, which should be moving forward, is going to turn into a choice bill because there's been a lot of resistance to the idea of a prohibition on dissection um, for a variety of reasons that you could probably imagine, uh, academic freedom issues and all that BS. So there has been resistance and it will turn into a choice policy, which isn't the worst thing in the world because actually 20 years ago when the choice stuff first started, uh, Connecticut was one of the first states to try to do it and they couldn't. Um, so it'll be nice. And House Bill 5794 would be a prohibition on the use of live animals in medical training, uh, emergency medical training. Uh, so there's a course called ATLS, the Advanced Trauma Life Support Course. And this course uses live pigs or dogs. In the case of Connecticut, it uses live pigs for this trauma training course that basically everyone else in the country uses simulators for. And we've had a very difficult time getting the facility, the Hartford Hospital, to switch over to the alternative. And we've worked with a legislator to get this legislation introduced that would make it illegal for them to use animals. This one looks a little more promising, but again, legislation's tough. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a very good use of my time personally, uh, unless you have legislators who are gonna be really aggressive about pushing it through and not timid about it. Uh, so there is, that's an option. And even getting something like introduced like that is important. Like in Connecticut, for example, uh, the dissection ban is the first one that's ever been introduced in the country. So even to know that there are legislators and there are people in power in these states who are willing to take that step and take that leap and introduce something like that and open up the dialogue is important. Again, you already have a choice policy here in Oregon, so I don't know how, you know, if something like that would be successful. And as I said, it's important to open dialogue. Um, you want to constructively engage faculty and administrators. You don't want to just come out, you don't want to just show up one day at their office with a petition with, you know, a thousand signatures and say, we're very upset about what's going on. Uh, it's only going to make it more confrontational. Uh, and confrontation's fine. I'm all for it in the right circumstances. But in, this, in these situations where you actually have a chance, especially on the university level, where all the power lies in the classroom and the teacher's hands, they don't need to get an approval from an administrator to switch what teaching method they're using in the classroom. If, if, a, if you can persuade a, a university professor to switch over to a different non-animal learning method, then they can do that. Uh, so you want to try to foster some kind of dialogue and, and uh, you'd want to try to foster dialogue. That's the first thing you want to do. Uh, you want to share information about your objections to the use of animals. Uh, give them information about the alternatives that are available. Uh, give them the evidence of their effectiveness and where they can get them and how they can get them. Uh, like I said, some of these alternatives are absolutely free. You can, get, you can loan them. You can get them on the internet for free. Uh, so these are all the concerns. These are all the major concerns that someone's going to have when you say, I'm unhappy with this animal use in this class, here's a better way to do it. They're going to say that, well, they're not as effective, how am I going to get a hold of them, they're expensive, uh, you know, all these things. So you want to address that right off the bat, and that's what we do when we're encountering schools who use animals, whether it's things we find out are on our own. It's always nice to have a student complain to us about something, because then it makes it a little more personal if we can tell the school, well, there's a student in your class who contacted us about this. Um, university professors are tough. Uh, you know, I'm going to be honest, we have very little success being able to resolve these things internally with universities. On a high school level, we've had much more success in terms of getting principals and teachers to actually switch over to using non-animal learning methods. Um, and it is because these people, they don't want to seem like they're kowtowing to animal rights groups. I mean, it could, you know, it has to do with the fact I'm coming from PETA. Uh, it probably, you know, it may be a, a more tame group like the animal, the uh, American Anti-Vivisection Society would be better, more well received uh, in this type of venue. But um, it's important to use, at least use this as a first step because if you escalate things, you can say, well, we attempted to, you know, work this out with you internally for three months and you've ignored our emails or you've brushed us off or you've referred us to someone else who doesn't care to address the issue. Um, so this is always the first step. We at least give them the benefit of the doubt that they're actually interested in, in you know, improving the uh, humaneness and effectiveness of their teaching tools and if they take the interests of their students seriously who object to these things. Um, and try to work collaboratively, collaboratively with them and don't make it adversarial right off the bat. Um, 
that's always the intention when we're dealing with animal issues, that we want to get something resolved right now. It can't wait. Um, and a lot of the time, I think animals suffer because of that. Um, I've certainly become much more patient, realizing that uh, in this context, it is a virtue. And uh, there is some benefit to be had by taking your time, allowing people to digest the information you're giving them, allowing them to just get comfortable with what you're laying on them. Because a lot of these, in a lot of these cases, this is the first time that any of these teachers have ever been confronted with this information. No one's ever challenged them on their teaching method that they've been using for 20 years. They've never seen any paper that said an alternative was as good as or better than what they're using now. Um, they've never even touched one of these computer simulator programs. I mean, it's completely foreign to them. And just like anything, you have to give them time to get comfortable with it. And tell them that you'll give them time to get comfortable with it. Um, and you want to work your way up the chain of command. And choose your contacts wisely. So if you contact the professor first and you don't get anywhere, you can contact the dean of that department. And then move on to, the, for example, the vice provost of academic affairs or someone who's in overseas undergraduate research, and then move on to the, you know, the university president or something like that. And that's usually the, the route we take. And by the time it gets to the president, if they don't know about it already, they're going to be really upset that this was tried, that in some cases, they're really upset that you tried, and especially if you provide them with all the correspondence you've had, they'll be upset that you tried to resolve this internally, and now they're getting sucked into this mess that could have been resolved another way. Um, so again, there's something to be said for actually taking the time, and this could take three months, this could take four months, you know, it's, again, it's not that uh, uh, immediate gratification that we all want, but it, it, it can make a real difference for animals. And in the cases where we have been able to have success replacing animal use in the classroom, it has been because we've taken time and allowed people to get comfortable with the information we've given, given to them and let them kind of come around to it on their own terms. There's some cases where we'll, you know, generally I follow up every single week with someone and check in and say, uh, and give them the email I sent prior to that one and say, I want to make sure you got this. When can I expect to hear from you? And I always end the email with a question that kind of compels them to write back. Or if at least if they don't write back, I say, hey, I, just, I asked you a question and I want to answer. Um, so yeah, you have to give them time. So what if this doesn't work? And in a lot of cases it won't. Um, you can do leaflets on campus about whatever the problem is. Uh, petitions, letter writing campaigns, letters and op-eds to local papers. Uh, most people in the community won't know that this is a problem unless you tell them it's a problem. Um, and I'm gonna tie in this with some of the stuff that's above. Work with the student government. I know some schools will have a student government that has the power to introduce a resolution to the entire university about something related to student affairs, whether it's student choice policy, whether it's an alternatives policy, whether it's ending a certain animal use, if you can get the support in the student government. One of the schools we're working with now, which is Marquette University, it's a private Catholic school in Wisconsin, if you can get 700 petition signatures uh, in favor of whatever issue it is, uh, you can get a vote by the student government without their prior approval of whatever the measure is, you can at least force them to vote on whatever the issue is. So we're working with them right now with students to collect, collect petition signatures to uh, prohibit the use of live animals in this uh, physiology class that we've been dealing with. Um, again, this is going to depend where you are. Uh, you could speak at a school board or a PTA meeting. Obviously, the PTA meeting would be for parents who are dealing with uh, issues related to their kids. But you can show up at a school board meeting, and I've certainly done this in the past with vivisection issues, uh, like university basic research issues and experimentation, uh, classroom experimentation issues. Uh, you can show up at a school board meeting. They usually have a public comment section, and you can air all your grievances. You have three minutes, five minutes, and you can you know, say you've, con you've attempted to contact these people. This is the information you gave them. You've received no response, and you want to know why, and you want the board to do something about it. Uh, a lot of the times, the, these board meetings are covered by the local media. Uh, certainly, these board minutes are posted on the internet, and you have a captive audience of all the, uh, the decision makers at a university, and they're going to listen to you, whatever you have to say. And that's important, because these people can put the pressure on the faculty members to some degree. Uh, there are union restrictions in terms of how much pressure you can actually put on a teacher to change their curriculum. Um, but certainly, the pressure is there, and they're going to feel it when you're uh, bad-mouthing them in front of, you know, people who are the be-all end-all. Uh, request for reconsideration of materials. On the K-12 level, whether or not you're a student on the K-12 level, uh, whether you 
live in this uh, district or not, you can, ref you can file a request for reconsideration of materials, which is right now your school is using baby chicks in this experiment in your 11th grade class, and we learned about it, and we think it's inappropriate, and here's other ways you can do it. And th some districts will have to um, form a committee, review everything that you provided to them, and then they'll vote on uh, whatever your request is. And these people will be made, the committees will be made up of community members, uh, teachers, administrators, and you'll have an opportunity to meet with this community, whether it's a, the committee, whether it's in person or via phone, uh, and speak to them about your issue, why you think it's important, and encourage them to support it. Um, protests, of course, that's always a possibility. Uh, and filing formal complaints, and when certain live animal use on the college level, you're going to be able to do this. Uh, if you're talking about, uh, depending on what species it is and what, depending on what school you're at, you could file a formal complaint with the university. Um, so how do you evaluate the outcomes? Like I said, it's not always going to be immediate grati instant gratification. You're not always going to know what happened right away. Uh, be persistent and be patient. I think I've stressed that enough. Uh, some of our cases take seven months before we get some kind of resolution. Uh, that could be uh, a university telling us that they're not going to do anything, uh, at which point you can escalate things. Uh, or this could be a university saying we've taken time to consider what you said and we agree with you on X, Y, and Z and we're going to be in the next, you know, either next semester or in the next few months we're going to be phasing out X, Y, and Z and replacing it with X, Y, and Z. Um, I've been dealing with a lot of cases related to the use of kittens and ferrets in intubation training, which is uh, usually for pediatric residencies or medical training courses where they'll use kittens and ferrets and uh, play, they'll have people repeatedly place a hard plastic pipe down their uh, pl hard plastic tube down their windpipe to teach them how to intubate infants. Uh, most places don't do this, but there are schools and hospitals and medical centers around the country that still do this, and we've been contacting them. And again, these are people who have been doing this, just training this way for a long time. And actually, in the case of this training, there's no evidence out there at all that says that these animals are any kind of good training tool, even from a scientific perspective. Uh, and again, the, the inclination of people who are giving the course is that it's self-evident. Uh, an infant is small and so is a kitten, and we can just you know, use the kitten as a stand-in for a human baby, which is completely crazy because a, a cat's tongue is much longer. They have crazy fangs. Uh, the the uh, anatomy of their mouth and throat is completely different. Um, but we've had, a, I think, three cases in the last six months where we contacted hospitals and universities about this and give, it, give, give them the information and you give them time to digest it and then we hear back and say, well, we're offering this course again a month from now and we won't be using animals anymore. Um, sometimes they won't give you something in writing that says that. Sometimes they'll say it over the phone to you, um, which requires that you just keep following up and making sure you're not using animals anymore. That could be a formal follow-up or that could be you calling as if you were wanted to register for the course and asking the question uh, in the future just to make sure they haven't gone back on what they told you. But a lot of places won't want to put something in writing because it's binding. Um, and in a lot of these cases, when we get a letter like that, we'll share it with other facilities and say, well, look what, you know, look what PSU did when we asked them to do this. Now you should do the same thing. And they don't want to be put in that position where they'd have to defend themselves or it looked like they were cooperating with animal rights activists or being coerced by animal rights activists. So they have to be aware of that, um, which is why I have victory question mark. The results of these, these efforts are not always straightforward or immediate or even apparent. You may try, you, know, you may work on a campaign for six months and, never feel, and feel like you never got anywhere and you may find out six months from then or a year from then that actually they never told you but they stopped using animals. Um, we submitted a Freedom Information Act request to the State University of New York downstate which is in Brooklyn and they have a medi uh, medical school there and it was related to the use of pigs. This is just a couple months ago related to the use of pigs in surgical training. And all we did, we heard, heard about it from a student and we filed a Freedom of Information Act request for the protocol from that course, which would have described the animal use. And they sent us the protocol, and they sent us a letter attached to the protocol saying that actually we decided to stop the use of pigs in this course. And that the course had been given two weeks before we contacted them with a Freedom of Information Act request. And as soon as they got a letter from us, which alerts them, number one, that PETA knows about what you're doing or activists know about your, what you're doing, and number two, they're going to try to do something about it. The school scrambles. You didn't ask them to do anything, but they say it's more trouble than it's worth. We're just going to stop it, 
uh, had they never heard from you, had they not even received a letter from you, they just would have continued doing what they were doing because no one ever challenged them. So it could be something, I mean, this doesn't happen, this happens rarely uh, that we hear about, but it could happen, you know, it could be happening much more frequently and we just don't know. Um, so the power, I mean, there's a lot of power in just simply contacting these people and saying, we know what you're up to, uh, give us some more information about it, which they're compelled to do under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and that's going to get you somewhere on its own. Uh, again, you're changing a culture. You're changing science. You're changing the way people think about science. You're changing the pe way people think about education, and that takes time, and it takes patience. But it's important. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there's consequences for animals and students. Um, and like I said, it's attacking viv vivisection at its roots. If people who are studying science and interested in science aren't introduced to it as an enterprise that involves harming animals, then when they get to graduate school, when they get to undergrad, when they get to medical school, they're not going to be comfortable with doing that. And they're not going to be, they wouldn't even consider undertaking a career that involves them doing that for a living every single day in and out because it seems so repulsive to them, or so foreign to them even, not if it's there's something that they're ethically opposed to, but something that they're, they're not comfortable with because they've never done it before, they've never been trained to do it. Um, the reason vivisection happens is because someone who's been, you know, cutting up monkeys for 40 years trains their, their grad students every single year for decades to do the same thing. And these people then trade in their grad students to do the same thing and it perpetuates itself. Um, so nipping the issue in the bud involves going in just like with, with veganism or any other issue and getting to young kids before they've made up their mind about things and giving them new information. Or in this case, uh, keeping information from them that would cause them to you know, do something that harms animals. Uh, that's it? All right. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, so, I in, so. so I hope people have questions. Well, if there wasn't the demand for them, they wouldn't be bred in the first place. Right? So if schools weren't ordering thousands, millions of animals a year or causing you know, these biological supply companies to hire people to go capture animals in the wild, we wouldn't have the issue of having uh, you know, warehouses full of animals. It just The problem wouldn't exist because the demand wouldn't be there. Um, obviously, it's a much smaller scale than when we're talking about farmed animals. Um, but the animals simply wouldn't be there because they're being bred just for this now. So if, we, if it wasn't profitable and people were uh, using the animals, there'd be, we wouldn't have to confront the issue of what the hell we're going to do with them because they wouldn't be there. I mean, I, I, I do encourage people to do that. I mean, I've been working with Elspeth a little bit about the PSU issue, but I mean, I love when people contact me about it because it is confusing. You don't know who to contact first. You're frustrated. You don't, you know, if you're at a university and you're going to be forced to participate in something um, and you have no, like I'm dealing, for example, I'm dealing with this student in St. Mary's College of California, which is in Northern California. And she was, she's a, she was enrolled until a week ago in this course that was, the session was mandatory. There was no option to use an alternative. And she contacted the professor and the professor told her, you know, we're not going to change anything. Your alternative, and this is, actually we hear this pretty frequently. The alternative, there is an alternative. Take a different course. Or there is an alternative. In St. Mary's case, they said there is an alternative. Take a course at a different university and we'll maybe transfer the credits for you. Um, and these are people at St. Mary's who are paying seven grand or five grand a class. I mean, something ridiculous like that. It's a private school. Um, and she was frustrated and she came to us and said, you know, I don't know what to do. Um, and we helped her write letters to the university uh, that kind of laid out the information. Because, I mean, we churn these out uh, regularly. The, the, you know, a basic letter that lays out the objection, the efficacy of the non-animal learning methods, and the desire to work towards some kind of resolution. And we helped her write a letter. Uh, and initially, this, the school was unresponsive. And then I started writing letters to them and saying, I'm dealing with this student. And here's what you've told her. And here's why none of these arguments are valid. And you need to address this issue. Uh, and after about two months now, the university said, well, we're going to meet about this. And in the fall, we're going to think about offering some kind of option for people. Um, so, I mean, I think it's daunting, and it's much more, I kind of regret that I didn't focus only on dissection because it's much more straightforward when you're only dealing with one type of animal use, right? So the dissection issue is pretty straightforward. There's a fine, for the most part, there's a finite number of animals who are going to be used and a finite number of exercises. Um, and when you're the person enrolled in a class, hello, Rue. If you're the person enrolled in a class, you're only going to be confronted with, I have to do this one cat dissection in my anatomy and physiology class and I'm, I don't want to do it and what do I need to do? Um, 
And I, you know, we have a letter for that. We have a letter that you can tailor to your own personal situation and send it in and get the ball rolling and at least open the discussion up. Um, and PETA has, uh, I think on the PETA 2 website, and I just actually helped uh, update this, they have a PDF, a packet, it's 10 pages, and it includes um, language for a, stu a sample student choice policy that's modeled after the best policies on the state level. But again, that address vivisection, that address uh, dissection, that address any kind of animal use. And that address either being in the room, because in some cases they say, okay, you have an alternative. You don't have to cut up the animal, but you have to watch. Um, and again, that's not an alternative. But the best policies say, address that and say, you don't have to observe it. You don't have to be in the room for it at all. Um, and the teacher has to be responsible for finding this alternative for you, right? Because that's part of it, is that you want to force these people to become familiar with the alternatives that are available and get comfortable with them. Um, so there's a sample policy, a sample choice policy. There's information about alternatives. There's like the top 10 resp responses to the top 10 questions you're going to get from your professor who doesn't want to give you an alternative. Uh, there's like a, pe there's a petition, a form for a petition. There's every, I mean, it's kind of self-contained, a self-contained campaign in this little PDF. Um, but every situation is going to be different and you're going to need guidance. Um, yeah, I mean, I suggest people contact PETA about it or contact me personally about it. Um, and it's hard. I mean, I, I think anyone who worked, worked on any kind of vivisection campaign, you don't just know what to do immediately. Uh, it's hard to just go on the Internet and figure it out for yourself, and it's good to work with people who have worked on the issue before, uh, are familiar with what you're going to confront and how to address it. So in terms of the, the classroom dissection, that's a resource we have available. The live animal experimentation is a little different. Um, every, for the most part, every single course is going to have a different learn educational objective uh, for using the animal experiment. Uh, the experiments are going to be a little different, uh, and in those cases, it usually requires you to file an, uh, an open records request with the school, asking for the worksheets associated that will outline the actual animal use for you. Then you need to, you know, go out and find what the alternatives are, and you know, we we usually compile some kind of packet to send to the university about it. Um, and again, some, you run into people who are very supportive. I, I'm dealing in a case in uh, Illinois right now where the president said, the president of the university said, I'm 100% in favor of what you're doing. I support the use of replacing all the live animal use in these classes, but it's up to the faculty and you need to work with them. But you can piggyback off something like that and say, listen, I've been dealing with the president and he's supportive of this. What do I need to do? You know, if you get someone on the phone, you get a meeting with them, you want to say, what's the problem? What is the obstacle? What's your objection to doing this? Even to offering a choice policy to students, if I can show you and all the information av available says that this is going to teach the student the same thing that what you're doing now is going to teach them. And you want to get them in a position, just like when we talk about vivisection debates, you want to get someone in a position where they have to actually really defend what they're doing. And not just with hyperbole and with rhetoric about how you're going to save babies in the, in the sense of in the case of vivisection, right? You want someone to scientifically defend what they're doing. And it's the same thing with classroom, classroom experimentation or dissection. You want to get someone in a position where you can say, what's your problem? What, do I need, what information do I need to provide to you to, show, to prove to you that this other way of doing things is going to get accomplished what you want to get accomplished and maybe even do a better job at it? Um, and if after you've given that to them and they are still not convinced, then you can consider getting other people involved and then showing them it's not only you who objects to this and has a problem with it, it's a thousand other people at your school who are willing to support it. It's another administrator at your school, it's people in the community. Um, and then that'll carry weight and, you know, again, these people don't want to be outed. Someone who's been doing this for a long time is perfectly comfortable doing it and been flying under the radar and requiring their students to cut up animals, um, especially in these, the case of live animals. Um, they don't want to be confronted with all this mess. Um, so if you attack it thoughtfully uh, and are patient, uh, I think people are receptive. Whether or not they're going to change immediately is a different story again. It, it's like with all the issues we work on, right? You don't see, nothing's immediate. Um, there's very few instances where you work on a campaign where you see immediate results, or any results, right? I mean, I think most of the things we work on, it's kind of on faith that something we're doing now or a leaflet we're handing to someone is going to change what they eat or what products they buy. Uh, or, you know, anything like that. So this is no different, um, except that you have access to the source of the problem. And, you, you know, and that's important. And I think that you can use, in that case, if they're, 
like, like I said, Tufts have, has this great program uh, for ethically sourced cadavers, and they only use ethically sourced cadavers. They completely got rid of the use of perfect, perfect bred animals there. Uh, and again, at Tufts, for example, uh, they never perform any procedure on an animal in the vet program that is going to cause harm to the animal. Uh, they don't operate on healthy animals. They only do something in a clinical setting with animals who are already sick. They practice spaying and neutering on animals who need to be spayed and neutered um, and things like that. So there are ways to get, like I said, ethically sourced cadavers, uh, and that's, that's fine. Um, any other type of animal use usually is not coming from a source like that. It's coming from animals who were killed at the pound. Uh, and again, if, if the pound is generating revenue by selling dead animals, then it's becoming a problem and there's no way to, and this is a euthanasia problem in general, there's no way to tell if the animals are being killed because they're sick or they're really not adoptable, which again is a problem in itself, or if they're killing animals simply because they can go sell them to the local university for you know, five or 10 or $15 each. Um, so that's not a sound source for animal cadavers. It's not ethically sound uh, by any means. You know, well, I mean, the, the choice policies usually say that there's, you're not going to be um, punished at all for not using the animal method, which would mean if they were going to give you a test that had information on it that you couldn't possibly glean from the whatever method they gave you to learn, then they would be punishing you for not using the standard method. Um, so if we were dealing with a facility or at a university level or uh, somewhere, a K-12 through school on a on the secondary and primary level, I don't think that you would encounter something like that uh, in terms of um, you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't encounter a situation like that because if the school has a policy, they're going to offer you an alternative that's going to give you the same information, and you're going to be tested on that information, and you'll be able to go on your merry way. Uh, if you're already in, enrolled in a class that and you're somewhere where that they don't have a policy, you're kind of in a tough situation, and that's when the students come to us when they're enrolled in a class and they're put in a position where they have to cut up an animal and they don't want to do it and the teacher says, well, you either drop the course or you fail or you, cut, you do the dissection and that's your only choices. Um, and at that point you have to, you know, assess what you're, you know, what you're going to do. Um, obviously that's a great time to, to ask for a choice policy um, and start, you know, trying to gain support for something like that. Um, but again, like I said with the choice policies, if there's a choice policy in your state, the best thing you can do is encourage other people to use it. Whether or not it, it has anything to do with you, whether or not you're a high school student, um, reaching out to high school students or reaching out to kids who are younger than and encouraging them to use the choice policy is going to be important for animals because for every student who opts out, that's one less animal who's being killed and one less, the demand for one less animal will be captured in the wild or killed at a you know, biological supply company. So it's important. So again, again, as with anything else, none of it's None of it's straightforward. None of it's direct. You can, I mean, you not participating is important, just like you being vegan is important. Being vegan doesn't stop animals from being killed everywhere, but being vegan is important for you, making that choice for you not to consume those animals and sending a message to other people and being able to talk to other people about it. Um, so opting out, is the same re opting out is important for the same reason something like vegetarian or veganism is important in that way in that it doesn't have these direct effects you see right away. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean with the best, again these are the best policies, not all policies. The list in the course guide before you sign up for a class, it'll mention something about, well, this is going to be part of the course and we'll offer you an alternative. Or in some cases, like UC Irvine, for example, will say there's going to be animal labs in this course and if you don't like it, don't enroll in the course. Oh, really? Which is why, you know, one of the things I said in the title of this is, you know, creating an inclusive learning environment because you're discriminating, discriminating against people and discour discouraging them not only from taking a course but pursuing whole fields of science because you're shutting them out of something like that um, and giving them no option. I mean, what's the option if you want to learn about neurobiology and you don't want to kill rats in a classroom? Um, they're not giving you another way to do that. Um, and I think most universities would, you know, they wouldn't want to upfront come out and say, well, that's, you know, we're comfortable with that. We're comfortable with discriminating, discriminating against certain students. Um, and that's something we try to um, touch upon when we're talking to universities, is if you look at any university's mission statement, there's going to be something about being inclusive, addressing diversity. And this is an, a, a diversity issue just as much as anything else is. Um, so, you know, that's something... If the, school is, if the school is offering you alternatives and they're not really um, 
solving the problem and it's something you're not comfortable with, you can, you know, confront them about that and, and address it. But it is, I mean, it. right, it comes down to it, it is your job, right? So yeah. you don't want, it's not any of our jobs to be <coughs> animal activists. It, you know, we see other people aren't doing it and we think it's important to do it. Um, so it's just like anything else in that way that you have to, you know, you take proper responsibility for the issue and, you know, you're willing to put the time and effort into it. And I think it's important, I think, that when it's coming from a student in the class, um, you're going to be much more well received because you have a personal stake in the issue and they're going to see um, that it's not just PETA trying to push their radical agenda on their school and you know it's 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 a personal thing this person this student has real ethical reservations about this and they've gone to all the trouble to find something that's going to help you as an educator and them as a student and other students in the future um, one of the things we do we have uh, an agreement with a company called Digital Frog International which is again I mentioned this pro program Digital Frog earlier and they create one of the, I think it's probably one of the more widely used digital, uh, digital deception programs, and they're based in Canada. And what we did with them is they offer a discount. They had created like basically a PETA discount code, and they sent us a hundred something demo copies of their software, and it has a discount code on it, and we send that to teachers, and we say, you know, here's a, a program to evaluate. We've taken a look at it. It's actually been presented at the last two National Science Teachers Association conferences. Uh, Dr. Nancy Harrison, who's a pathologist in San Diego, has given a presentation she called Best of the Best uh, about virtual dissection software, and she presents Digital Frog and a program called Dry Lab Fetal Pig Plus, or Dry Lab Plus Fetal Pig. Um, and the evaluations of this presentation she gives has been, have been fabulous in terms of people thinking that the information was useful and indicating on their evaluation forms that they're going to take this information and uh, about the software and integrate these learning tools in their classrooms immediately. Um, so sharing information like that, uh, you're indicating that not only has this been, not only have you taken a look at this and seen that it's, a, it's easy to navigate, uh, it covers everything they want to cover. And in the case of Digital Frog, it has not only anatomy, it has ecology, it has physiology. So it's not only addressing dead animals and the parts of a dead animal, it's addressing the animal in the environment and the working parts of an animal, which most dissection doesn't cover. Um, so you're not really learning very much about an animal at all. Especially because, uh, as an aesthetic issue, when you get an animal in a classroom, all the organs, everything looks the same color, and it's all mushy, and in real life, that's not what an animal looks like. Parts are different colors. Uh, so you're not really learning very much about what the actual insides of an animal look like, the actual anatomy. Um, so anyway, Digital Frog is a great program, and we send this to schools with a letter and we give them the information about the recent NSTA conferences and the presentations and we send them the software and then we'll follow up and say, did you have a chance to take a look at the software? Some schools will have, will convene all their science teachers and do a demo of it and take a look at it. Um, in some cases we've been, we've been able to get science teachers who are uh, interested in the issue to take it and actually visit schools who have expressed interest in integrating it into their curriculum, cur curricula and uh, they'll go and do a demonstration and work with, you know, science teachers to show them the different features of the programs. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have things like that available. We have demo copies of software available that you can provide to your teachers and say, take a look at this, here's some literature about how effective these things are and uh, how easy it would be for you to integrate. And again, the economical issue is going to be important for a lot of people also because schools are cutting resources, especially now, schools don't have money for anything. So if you can show them a way that they can save money, and do the same thing, that's going to be important, especially now. Um, that's a great issue to address. Yeah, there's, uh, I'd say there's a half a dozen good cat programs out there. Um, I could send you, I just actually, we just redid our cat letter. That new, that new uh, paper came out about the clay modeling. Uh, is your A and P class looking at, I mean, are you looking at cat anatomy or are you using cat anatomy as a way to study human anatomy? So that's what both of these papers address, is that there's this program called Anatomy and Clay, where consistently people are doing, the kids are doing better on the tests of human anatomy when they do these anatomy, the, the clay modeling exercise, as opposed to the students who are in the same classroom and who are taking the same test who did the cat dissections. Um, I mean, you know, I think teachers don't read this literature. You know, they just don't read it. They're not encouraged to read it. They don't have time to read it. Their school districts or, the, you know, uh, the administration isn't asking them to go out. There's not like, uh, 
With doctors, you need to get continuing medical, medical education credits, right? So once you become a doctor, you have to do a certain amount of uh, additional education, every, a certain amount of hours every year on learning about what the developments in the field are, what are new educational tools, surgical procedures. Professors don't need to do that. So you learn one thing and you just continue to do it forever. So you really have to teach them. I mean, it's really, that's what you're doing. You're re-educating these people. And again, that's why I said it takes time, it takes effort. Um, but it's important because if you don't do it, there's a chance that no one else will ever do it. The next person who's in the class who's confronted with this may be like, well, shit, I don't have a choice. They're forcing me to do this. Or the alternatives suck and I'm going to fail the test. Or, you know, all these other things that they're going to be confronted with. So I'll take your question. Well, most people say, and this actually is an issue that came up in the State House of Representatives at, after we introduced this bill uh, last month, was people say, well, I... Um, I dissected animals, are you saying I'm a callous person? Because well, some of the research says that it fosters callous, callousness towards animals, uh, which is one of the reasons why you see people becoming animal experimenters, um, and callous, callousness towards animals in nature. Um, so regarding the trauma, they say, well, those are isolated incidents. Most people aren't, these, these profound effects aren't being exhibited in most people who, who dissect animals, which you can't measure. So it's hard to say, but if it's happening, and the issue is this. If you're going to have two students out of a class of 20 whose complete lives are going to be changed by forcing them to do dissection, and you have the option of giving everyone a learning method that's not going to upset anybody and provide them with the same education, then I would think it's your ethical responsibility as an educator to provide the more inclusive educational tool to everybody, right? And, you know, I try not to be so forward about that, and, but that's the, you know, that's the point. You know, I have a, well, the old administrators say, in 10 years I've never been addressed with this issue once before, after being, after a student would bring it up to them. And I say, well, that doesn't matter. One student in 10 years, if that's, you know, if you're going to change a student's life or discourage them from pursuing a career, and it takes, you know, basically it costs them nothing to offer an alternative, then I think it's their ethical obligation to do that. And they shouldn't just be able to say because of per reasons of personal bias or archaic tradition, we're just going to keep doing this because this is what we feel like doing. Um, you know, they should take, you know, their students' education seriously and their students' lives seriously. Um, so, that's, you know, after six months, that's where you start. <laughs> that's where you get. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of the research about uh, the more subjective experience that students have in these classes is in the social, social psychological, and sociological literature. Um, and you can't ignore that. You can't say, well, that's not every student, because if you look at the literature that does exist that has studied this, I mean, even if it's a minority, a large minority of students, students who are doing dissections, or, or if you ask undergrads who did dissections in high school, a large minority of them are saying they had, they have negative, they had a very negative experience. Um, and you could curtail all of this. I mean, it's really easy. There's, like I said, there's no scientific, educational, or ethical justification for c continuing to do dissection, especially. Um, and you're basically ruining people's lives or changing their lives profoundly, right? And you're getting, you know, and you're getting students who they do become callous about animals. Mm -hmm. The same way you have kids who, you know, like animals when they're very little, and then they start eating them, and they become socialized to think, well, these are just things to exploit, and I can do whatever I want. I'll wear them and eat them and go to the circus and the zoo and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can't understate the impact. I, I think you can't understate the impact it has on students. And you have to take it seriously and address it. And again, s teachers don't know about any of this. I mean, everything I've talked about today, most teachers have no idea that this literature exists, that this is a discussion, because people aren't asking them to go look into it. You know, dissection isn't required. It's just what everyone does. So mm -hmm. they continue doing it. But like I said, dissection is unregulated. So there's not a government mandate like there is with monkey experiments, for example, that you at least, even if you're not going to use them because you don't feel like it, which is basically what pe most people do, even if you're not going to use it, you at least have to say, oh, I looked, I did a database search and found three alternatives, I don't like them, so I'm going to continue to do animal experimentation. At least they can't say that they don't know that the alternatives are out there or that they're effective. Um, in the case of dissection, there's no process like that that forces people to reevaluate their, their, their uh, the educational tools they're using in the classroom. And if you look at all the literature and all the international surveys, countries like Norway, for example, where dissection is virtually non-existent in high school, their, great, their, science, their standardized science test grades are consistently higher than the United States, and countries like the United States are consistently decreasing, and their, their scores are consistently decreasing in these things. And that's not to say that it's dissection only and we're, we're providing dissection. But it's to show that we're not reevaluating re our teaching tools. We're worrying about things about like no child left behind, 
and we're not worrying about other things that matter that are influencing children's education and their psychological development. Um, so it is, I mean, it's this re-education process. I mean, I think if I went back to college, I'd get a master's in education or something like that where it would give me some authority to talk about these things beyond being an activist. I mean, I have a master's in, so in sociology. Um, so I do try to exploit that when I can. Um, but I wish I was a science teacher teaching science teachers. Um, in college, on the college level, people who are coming to school to get credentialed and whatnot, because you can talk about these things. Because once they get into the field, you know, if you look at all these papers that are published, most of them aren't by science teachers. Like I said, they're sociologists, they're psychologists, they're social psychologists, they're people in the animal community, but they're not science teachers. And so you're publishing these papers, even in the educational journals that science teachers should be reading. But most people don't do that because they simply don't have time. They're worried about budget constraints in the classroom, about the kids right now in their classroom learning. They don't have time to just completely, uh, you know, reevaluate and retool uh, the method they're using to teach. Um, so these are very practical considerations that we have to take seriously, and that's why you know I gave the list before of obstacles. Those are all obstacles that we have to overcome before we can even you know start to make these changes. If we have to open up the dialogue with people about this exists, this literature exists. I'm not asking you to read it. I'll summarize it for you. Here it is, and we should talk about it. Um, and that's important. You know, again, it's like any other any other area of activism where you want to get a dialogue going. It's the same reason you leaflet out of the side of the supermarket about veganism or you know, hand out leaflets about OHSU is because you just want to start talking about it with people. Um, but the difference, again, with science education is that these teachers can change. They can make the change in their classroom. They have the power to do that. And they don't have the stake like a vivisector has. They don't have a stake, a social stake, and a financial stake in continuing to dissect. In fact, if it's, it, the research shows it's going to be easier and cheaper for them not to dissect animals, and it's going to be a better teaching tool for their students. So if you can impress that upon them, I think it's appealing. But you have to be able to approach them in a way that's not adversarial, that's not confrontational, and that they feel comfortable uh, exchanging in a dialogue with you. And that's hard, especially, you know, like I said, when you get an email from me, it's coming from PETA, so they're immediately on guard. That's why I'd, like to, I'd much prefer to work with students behind the scenes and help them write the letters and help them open up the dialogue and talk about it. Um, because the issue is taken much more seriously. Um, so, and, and PETA 2 does a lot of that, but PETA 2 kind of gives you the packet, and they have a lot of other campaigns they're working on, and that's what they've done for a long time, is, you know, they give you the packet, and I don't know if students are following up um, the way they need to, in the way that we're yeah. continuing to see that you need to follow up and speak about these issues. I mean, you have, again, you have to be it's, you know, slow and steady wins the race. I, that's, it's totally how it is. And I came to PETA, you know, I've been there for almost two years and I've done activism for years before that. And I wanted everything to change immediately. I want to write one letter and get a letter back saying, you're right, Mr. Goodman, we're, you know, we're stopping animal experimentation tomorrow. Um, but it doesn't happen. And the more you read the literature that's out there, um, and I'm not even a teacher, and I'm sympathetic to the issues that teachers are facing um, when it comes to this. I mean, it, teachers are getting laid off. I mean, you, you have to realize all these things that are going on in the mind and the world of a teacher, and then you're bringing something that probably seems very trivial to them, and saying, this is something you, we want you to address right now. Let's talk about it. Uh, and you can't expect them to do that. Um, you know, it seems urgent for us, and it is urgent for us, and it is urgent for animals. Um, but you have to take your time, and I, you know, I, I don't know. I think, there, like I said, there's a lot to be said for this approach, this slow approach, this educational approach. And if you look at yourself as, some, as, as an educator and maybe not an activist um, who is going to have this adversarial relationship with whoever the, you know, the target is or whoever you're contacting is, I think you're going to get much further that way. Um, and this goes for college and for, for high school, you know, just being able to have a healthy rapport. Being a student like any other student who has a concern about a class and you want to talk about it and you generally, genuinely want to resolve the problem. I mean, students have problems all the time with their teachers that they want to sit down and discuss, and in most cases, you can sit down with a teacher and you can resolve those issues. And this thing should be addressed the same way, but you have to approach it the same way. It's a very personal problem that has a very real solution that's attainable and you want to help them do that. Um, and again, that's something I can't do because I'm not a student. I work for an animal rights organization, um, and I simply can't go to every single school we're dealing with and sit down with them and talk about it. Um, but students can do that, um, which is why, again, I encourage students to do the, I'll help you, and I'll do whatever you need to do. I'll write letters for you. I'll, you know, find that, we'll, you know, we have people who can find contact information for you, uh, strategize who you should contact first and next, and 
when the next student uh, government meeting is to talk about this issue, how the student government can address it, uh, what power you have as a student, when the next board meeting is, how long you can speak for, how many words you should, I mean, we can help you with all of this. Um, but again, the power is in your hands as a student, as a stakeholder in whatever it is, whether it's your college or your medical school or your high school. Um, <coughs> yes, so there's a lot of information out there. Um, and it takes some time. Um, you can't simply just, you know, write an angry email and hand in a petition and resolve everything, unfortunately. I, I mean, I think if you're at a university that has student, you know, has at least one animal rights activist. I mean, you know, that's tough. You know, when I got to the University of Connecticut, there was nobody there. Like, we started a group from scratch, and really, for the three years I was there, there was only two, me and my wife were the only two people there who were doing any activism. And any, and any animal issue on campus had to be addressed by the two of us because there was no one else who was willing to put the time or effort into it. Um, you really just need to find one person. And the way you find that person may not be someone coming to you. It may be you going on a campus and simply leafleting about the dissection issue, and you find someone who may sign your mailing list who's particularly interested in taking it on, or who never knew somebody could help them take on the issue, so they never addressed it before. And I think that's a lot of it. And that's one of the, you know, when we talk about psychological trauma, and we talk about these long-term psychological uh, effects of you know, students engaging in uh, dissection or having to view dissection, um, people don't really, I mean, even if people don't know they have the option not to do it or they feel like they're coerced into doing it because they may get a bad grade or even if they ask for the alternative, the teacher may view them differently or they may be ostracized by their peers. Uh, so they may not say anything about it. Someone who is vegan may do a dissection because they feel like they have no choice. Um, so, you know, giving someone, uh, so going to a campus and getting back to what I was saying, going to a campus and leafleting about dissection or animals and education issues, you'll, you're going to find people who are sympathetic or find people who are confront, who've been confronted with this before or who are going to be confronted with it and want help in trying to address the issues. Um, and that's your in, right? That's your in is getting someone who has a stake in the problem right now and taking it on with them um, as an activist. And you can do that. I mean, I think invariably you can go to any campus and and go and hand out leaflets and find somebody who says, you know, I've dealt with this before, how can you help me? Right, I mean, I think that's part of it. And, you know, I kind of, I'm going to have to go back too far, but I don't usually address the ecological issue because I think it kind of falls under the ethical, I kind of roll it up into the ethical concerns, but the, we use a three-pronged three approach, which is talking about the economics, the ethics, and the educational uh, concerns related to, to classroom dissection or animal, exper or animal experimentation in general. Um, so we do address the economics. The problem with the economics is it's sometimes hard for people to see the benefit immediately because some programs are free, right? So like I said, some programs, you can have your entire classroom log on to their computers and you know do the, do the virtual dissection. It costs the school nothing. The teacher just has to learn how to use the software and be able to direct you through it. Um, some of the programs, there's a larger one-time expense, even if it's $700. Um, I guess basically what I'm saying is that that on its own has never been compelling enough for people because it doesn't add up to very much. If you're talking on a state level, you know, and there's 100 schools and they're all doing dissection and spending $2,000 you know, $2, a year on dissection, and you can project over five years and say, well, you're going to save a lot of money, um, then if you can get that audience and you can, make it, you can make that argument to them, I think it's compelling. But if you're talking to one school and... You can tell them over five years, if you buy this one program with a PETA discount, we tell them you can get, buy it for $700. You'll never have to buy anything again. Um, and they're spending $1,000 a year. If you could say, tell them they're saving four grand over five years, sometimes that's compelling. But I think the financial issues are, that they're dealing with are usually on such a larger scale than that, that that alone doesn't make them say, oh, you know, you're right, we should switch. It certainly helps. And it depends. I think every state is in a bind right now. So it's a great way to address the issue. Um, in Connecticut, you know, with this bill, that was one of the main issues we addressed on this executive summary. We did an economic analysis. That, you know, you're going to save a ton of money on a state level if you, you know, if you endorse this. Um, so I think it's useful. I think it's very useful. Um, if you can project it out over a period of time, that gives you a large number that's impressive to people. Because saying you're going to save $1,000 this year, it's like, well, we could give kids two less tater tots at lunchtime and we'll save a thousand dollars. You know, so you have to make it seem like, or you have to not make it seem like, you have to be able to show it's a bigger problem. 
than that. It's a bigger problem than $800 or $1,000. Um, and because schools are focusing and are so focused on the now and the problems that are happening now, um, it's hard to be able to say, well, we want you to address this now and in 10 years you'll see the benefits um, or major benefits. Because they'll benefit financially right away, but I think the numbers, not, the numbers aren't big enough to make that compelling on its own. I think rolled into everything else, it's a great way to address the issue. And there's going to be someone at the school who says, you know, they're absolutely right. We don't have money for this, and if we stop doing this, we can spend the money here. Um, and that's important. So yes, it's an important issue to address. We can talk more informally without me standing up here lecturing. All right, well, thanks for listening. <laughs>